In the picturesque Port Macquarie, nested along shores, two high school friends, Ethan Byers and Lily Monroe, thought they would skip school for the day and go for a swim. It was a warm spring day, the sun beaming down from a clear blue sky, and the monotony of their daily routine drove them to give in to a moment of rebellion. Ethan, a charismatic and thrill-seeking teenager, proposed skipping school and venturing to a secluded cove along the shore. Lily, who shared his thrill-seeking spirit, couldn't resist and agreed to go with him for the day. Leaving the confines of the school behind, Ethan and Lily set out on their journey with bicycles so they could come home more easily. The anticipation grew with each pedal stroke as they neared the cove. A hidden gem tucked between rocky cliffs and embraced by the turquoise embrace of the ocean. The cove was completely isolated from where people might like to walk, so they thought it was the perfect place where no one would find them. The marine life teemed with a diverse array of creatures, but mostly just small fish and the odd crab. They left their backpacks in the corner of the cove under some trees and immediately went swimming. The pair had known each other for a long time, and such outings were common. They swam in the water, relaxing as the weather was ideal for a swim. They circled the cove and cracked jokes the entire time, not having a care in the world. However, things started to change when the damp hairs on his neck stood up. Lily, who was still swimming next to him, turned around and cried as she started to flail in the water. Ethan looked back to check, but it was too late. A massive bull shark was behind them, not slowing down and heading directly for Ethan. He tried to swim back to the shore, but the shark had already caught up and clamped down on his right hamstring, not letting him move his leg. Lily could hear his tendons snapping under the water and kept screaming, unsure of what to do. He simply screamed and screamed until his head was pulled under the surface. Instinct kicking in, Lily started swimming fiercely toward the shore, where she sat on the sand and screamed for Ethan. A moment later, he emerged again, waving his arms around and screaming through gurgles. He was there only momentarily, before getting dragged under the surface again. Sharks are notorious for not killing their prey immediately, but taking bites and slamming into it underwater until it dies. This was exactly what had happened to Ethan while he was under the surface. Lily sat there, paralyzed from shock and fear, as she saw the splashing water die down to only ripples, and the water was painted a deep red. She knew he was gone, but she couldn't accept it. She remained there for an undisclosed amount of time, just staring at where she saw Ethan and cursing the day that they decided to skip school. Her trance was only broken by his body floating to the surface, mangled beyond recognition. At that point, she finally passed out from the shock. Later, she was hyperventilating as she realized where she was, but she still tried her best to walk away from the scene and find someone to help her. No one was near the cove or on the surrounding beaches, so she had to walk back to town, knowing that Ethan's body might get swept away to sea if she didn't hurry. She walked into the first convenience store, stammering about what happened to the frightened clerk who called emergency services. They were dispatched to the scene with two medics staying in the store to talk to Lily and ensure she was okay. When the police arrived, Ethan was already floating toward the horizon, but they managed to recover him and alert his family about what had happened. Lily never really recovered from the incident, even though years had passed. She constantly blamed herself for what happened, and it took years of therapy to get over that, but not over the bad dreams or the regret of that day. In the picturesque coastal town of Byron Bay, Australia, lived a young and adventurous boy named Andy. With sun-kissed hair and a spirit that matched the golden shores, Andy spent his days exploring the ocean's wonders and embracing the thrill of new adventures. One sunny day, Andy was on a pristine beach where he planned to test his newly acquired drone. Eager to capture breathtaking aerial shots of the crystal clear waters, he carefully calibrated his device and launched it into the sky. As the drone soared higher and higher, Andy marveled at the stunning view it provided 
capturing the vibrant hues of the coastline. However, in a cruel twist of fate, the drone suddenly lost connection and spiraled out of control. Panic gripped Andy's heart as he watched his prized possession hurtle toward the unforgiving waters below. Fueled by desperation, he made a split-second decision. He would attempt to retrieve his drone, no matter the cost. Disregarding the warnings that echoed in his mind, Andy plunged into the water without hesitation. With each stroke towards the drone's last known location, his heart raced, a mix of unwavering determination and underlying fear. The weight of the water pulled at his limbs, but Andy pushed forward, his eyes fixed on the surface. Meanwhile, on the beach, Andy's father, Jeff, noticed his son's reckless endeavor. A man of unwavering love and protective instincts, Jeff knew he had to act swiftly to save his child from the impending danger. With his heart pounding, he sprinted towards the water, fear fueling his every step. Upon reaching the site where the drone had crashed, a wave of despair washed over Andy's heart. The crashing waves enveloped him, obscuring his vision and instilling an unsettling sense of foreboding. In a sudden and chilling moment, a dark shadow emerged from the deep, a shark. Andy's heart raced, fear seizing his entire being. The shark immediately pounced on Andy's arm, causing him to cry out and scream in extreme pain. He was panicking and trying to pull his arm out of the shark's mouth, but it was useless. The shark was now trying to shake his body in the water, causing him to feel pain, not just in his bitten arm. As the shark attacked Andy, his father Jeff leaped into action. With the strength of a lion and a love for his son that knew no bounds, Jeff tackled the shark, diverting its attention away from Andy and releasing the poor boy's bloodied arm. The predator's powerful jaws clenched around Jeff's arm, causing searing pain to shoot through his body. Despite the agony, Jeff refused to relent. He wrestled with the shark, summoning every ounce of strength he possessed. The battle raged on, father against nature's fury, as Andy watched in awe and terror. Jeff pried the shark's jaws with bravery and determination, allowing Andy to swim away safely. As Andy reached the shore, his father emerged from the water, bloodied but victorious. The bond between them was unbreakable, forged by the crucible of adversity. People on the beach were astonished, marveling at the heroic act they had just witnessed. Andy clung to his father, tears mingling with the salty ocean spray, overwhelmed with gratitude for his father's selfless bravery. Their lives had been forever changed in those terrifying moments, but their love and resilience had triumphed over the jaws of tragedy. News of the extraordinary rescue spread like wildfire, touching the hearts of people across the globe. Jeff's courageous act inspired countless individuals, reminding them of the incredible lengths a parent would go to to protect their child. As the wounds healed, a newfound appreciation for life blossomed within Andy and Jeff. They learned to cherish every moment, never taking their time together for granted. The beach that had once been the setting of their darkest hour now held a deeper significance, a testament to the strength of their bond and the indomitable spirit of a father's love. story mixes blood, bones, and the natural beauty of the Floridian waterways into a nightmare for Adam Dougal, a 26-year-old American software developer who booked a trip that would change his life forever. In July 2010, Adam was working in his office when he felt immense pressure in his chest, followed by an overwhelming sense of panic. He started hyperventilating, and a bystander rushed to help him. After 20 minutes of sheer panic, Adam finally calmed down and was called to HR for a conversation. He spoke to a representative, and they both agreed that the work he was doing had been taking a toll on him, so they offered him a vacation to take a break from work and recuperate, as they didn't want him having panic attacks for something that can be managed outside the workplace. He left earlier that day and was given two weeks of paid leave, which he appreciated. He had to finance his vacation with his own money, but
but that was not an issue, as he had been living alone then. Within the week, he had booked a trip to Ponce Inlet, Volusia County, Florida, for some much-needed relaxation. Adam had been living in Wisconsin then, so warm weather was welcome. Right after his flight, Adam visited the nearby beach cafes on his first day to have a pint. He met some locals, and they praised the beauty of their beach and welcomed him for his trip. One offered to give him a lift to his motel, which he accepted, and he was ready for the rest of his stay. The first few days were spent enjoying the sights of Ponce Inlet, and he even took a day trip to Orlando to meet up with some online friends, and they had dinner. The next day, Adam left his motel around 9 a.m. to get to the beach before everyone else and snag a decent spot in the shade. He arrived at the beach and enjoyed a few hours of lounging around and reading a book before he picked up his snorkeling gear and went into the water for a swim. From a young age, he had always loved snorkeling and enjoyed looking for shells as deep as he could dive. During his swim, Adam noticed the array of colors at the bottom of the bay where he was and resolved to dive down and look for any oddities that might cross his path. As he got deeper, the water got colder and he could feel the pressure in his ears building, but he pressed on. Diving deeper into the murk, Adam was amazed by the complexity of flora and fauna. He swam through the kelp, collecting small shells that caught his attention. He noticed his breath was running out after about a minute under the water, so he resolved to return to the surface. As he turned upwards, his attention was caught by something opaque moving in front of him. It was a jellyfish. Adam did not know much about jellyfish, but he knew to avoid them, so he swam around them and rushed as his breath was running out. About nine feet from the surface, he looked behind himself only to see a dark shape dart from his vision and further behind him. But he couldn't tell what it was. Panic started to set in, but he couldn't focus because of a tremendous searing pain in his left shoulder. He rapidly spun around as his vision was clouded by a red mist, his blood gushing as a juvenile bull shark held onto him and thrashed, ripping the muscle away and tearing tendons to shreds. He released the rest of his breath he had in his lungs and flailed his left arm to get the thing to let go of him, and it did after just a moment. His lungs burned because of the lack of oxygen, but he knew he had to keep kicking despite the pain. He neared the surface as he felt his consciousness shuddering, but he was close. His head breached the water, and he took a huge breath, clearing his mind and letting him focus on the pain in his shoulder. Just as he started to swim back to the shore, some ten yards away, the wind was knocked out of him by a coarse, hard blow to the stomach. Sharks are opportunistic hunters, and they tend to attack their prey in surges, either biting their prey or bumping into it, hoping to disorient it and make the kill easier. Aside from the shock, Adam was not swayed and continued kicking to the shore and back to safety. He used only one arm for swimming, but he did manage to reach his destination. He screamed as he stood up and started running toward other people watching the scene unfold. They didn't understand what was happening and no people were in the water with him. Two bystanders rushed in to help him, taking him to a nearby clinic where his wounds were tended to. He spent the day in the clinic sizing his wounds and letting the doctors assess the damage. They determined that his arm would be functional but would never feel the same. He spent the rest of his vacation wrapped up in bandages, wearing a sling to keep his arm in place, and went home on a normal flight. Despite the stress of the situation, Adam's anxiety vastly improved as he realized that the mundaneness of normal life would never be as concerning as a life-and-death situation. The sun was setting on a warm July evening in 2015 as six teenagers made their way down to the secluded bay on the eastern coast of Florida. The subjects of this group that found themselves amid blood and teeth are Eric and Kenneth Lang, two brothers whose idea was to go on a trip across Florida. The group consisted of four boys and two girls in their late teens. They had been planning this trip for weeks, eager to explore the lesser-known beaches of the state. 
The teenagers had heard about the beautiful bay on the internet and were excited to check it out. However, they had been warned to stay away from the area due to a recent spike of shark sightings. But the group ignored the warnings, believing the sightings were exaggerated and it was safe. They chose to go to the bay in the very early hours of the morning to avoid getting told off by someone who took the warning seriously. As they waded into the still cold waters of the bay, they talked among themselves and joked about their memories of the trip up to that point. Although cold, the water was quite enjoyable, so the group had no worries. Eric and Kenneth were talking about their parents' concern about considering going on that trip when Eric yelped in pain and surprise. His brother asked him what the matter was, and he pulled his leg up to the surface to reveal it was roughed up as if someone had dragged sandpaper across it. They didn't understand what could have done it, but the pain wasn't too bad. They decided to swim in more shallow water, so they started back. As they were swimming, Kenneth noticed a dark shape underneath them. Nervous, he told his brother to swim faster as they approached the group. As he said that, he saw a large dorsal fin cut through the water and dip down again, only to feel a violent blow to his stomach. The wind was knocked out of him, and he fought to take a breath of air, but it came along with some salt water, causing him to stop swimming. Eric looked back and at that moment felt the worst pain of his life as the tiger shark assaulting them clamped onto his cap with tremendous force. He screamed, alerting the rest of the group to the situation. They froze in place and didn't know what to do. One started swimming toward them, only to be dragged back by the other boy. The girls fled the scene. It was later revealed that they ran to the town to call for help while the two remaining boys stood and watched the scene unfold. Eric flailed in the water and tried to kick the shark away with his free leg, but it was not intending to let go anytime soon. Kenneth acted on sheer adrenaline and instinct, diving into the water to get the shark off his brother. He tried pulling it off, but it didn't work, so he grabbed its head and started kneeing it in the snout. It let go after that point. The shark darted towards the group, its jaws wide open. One of the boys, Alex, tried to swim away, but was quickly pulled underwater by the massive predator. The other teenagers screamed as they watched in horror as the shark thrashed its massive body in the water. The girls in the group arrived back at the scene with a fisherman in tow. He understood the area well and intended to help the boys as best he could while the ambulance arrived. The fisherman was taking some harpoons to be sharpened and maintained when the girls ran up to him screaming and crying, so he immediately came to their aid. With one harpoon in his hand, he jumped into the water and swam toward the boys, calling them to swim toward him. They did so, but not without their share of discomfort. Eric could feel his bones grinding against each other with each kick in the water, and Kenneth was barely breathing because of swallowing so much water before. They met at the halfway point, and the fisherman grabbed hold of Eric and started swimming back to shore with both of the boys. At that moment, the shark returned, choosing Kenneth to rip its next morsel off. He was dragged under the water and thrashed around by the shark, only to be released after a few moments. He rushed to swim back to the surface, but the shark was eager for more meat and bit into his upper thigh harder than before. He let out all of the air in his lungs in an attempt to scream, and he could feel his consciousness fading fast. The last thing he saw before he breathed air in again was the flash of the fisherman's harpoon passing his head and jamming itself straight into the shark's snout. The fisherman let Eric swim back to shore on his own to help Kenneth, and just in time at that. Kenneth remembered feeling the pain in his thigh ease up a bit, and the feeling of running water as he was dragged back to the surface by the man. Both of them resurfaced and took massive breaths of air, much to Kenneth's relief. Eric was lying on the beach in tremendous pain, but he never kept his eyes off where the fisherman dove to find his brother. He could hear the ambulance in the distance and knew everything depended on them returning to shore. Should they succeed, the nightmare would be over. Kenneth could feel himself slowly regaining consciousness, but was still dizzy because of the blood loss. They kicked through the water as much as they could, eventually reaching the point where they could stand up and walk back to shore. 
As soon as he stood, Kenneth collapsed, and the fisherman hoisted him up on his shoulder. He carried the young boy back to his brother and laid him beside him. The sound of the ambulance was getting louder and louder, so all they could do was wait. The vehicle eventually arrived, and they loaded the teenagers into it, tending to their wounds on the way there. As they left their sight, the fishermen scorned the rest of the group for not heeding the official warnings and acting like idiots. He didn't let them leave and insisted on calling their parents to update them on the situation. They protested but understood their lives were in question, so they gave in. Eric and Kenneth's parents immediately rushed to the bay to see their sons, but the drive was over an hour away. When they got to the hospital, their mother demanded to see her sons. She was updated on their situation and was informed that Eric would likely be okay. But Kenneth had suffered brain damage due to blood loss and lack of oxygen. He was stable but unresponsive. After waiting a few days, the doctors informed the family that both boys would pull through, although Kenneth's motor functions and speech would be irreparably distorted. The boys continued their lives as best as they could, and their parents never reprimanded them for their irresponsible decision to swim in that bay. They were just happy their sons were alive. On April 5, 1992, in a coastal town known for its tranquil charm, an unexpected incident shook the community to its core. John Miller, a middle-aged man with a taste for adventure, was in a dangerous situation after accidentally falling from a canoe and getting attacked by a large tiger shark. John left his motel in the early morning hours and headed to the docks to meet up with an old fishing buddy and have a conversation about some real estate the pair were planning on buying. They sat down in a cafe and discussed business matters when his friend Albert suggested they could paddle out to a nearby cay where they could sit down on the beach and relax. It was a nice day and John accepted, not knowing what would ensue because of that decision. They found a man renting canoes for as many hours as needed, so they rented two out for five hours, considering the time it took them to reach the quay and back and the time they would spend there. Before long, they were on the water and happily paddling to the quay, about a mile away from the docks. Around the halfway point, John and Albert were talking about their families, when John's canoe suddenly flipped its front end back, throwing John into the water with a mighty splash. Albert called out to him as he floated up to the surface, asking what in the world had just happened. As he tread water, he tried to reach out to his canoe to get back inside when he yelped and threw his head back in surprise, telling Albert that something had brushed against the back of his legs, something rough like sandpaper. Understanding that they were not alone there, John rushed to get back inside the canoe and managed to do so most of the way. He was almost inside, but as he tried to haul his right leg into its compartment, he was horrified as a pair of massive jaws came crashing through the surface and biting into his leg. He roared as the pain shocked his body, and he was forcefully pulled back into the cold water. Albert was very close to John and tried to grab onto his life jacket, but to no avail. Adrenaline coursed through John's veins as he realized his dire predicament. With his heart pounding, he fought against the relentless shark, which showed no signs of letting go soon. It thrashed around, ripping through John's muscles and tendons like ribbons. After a moment had passed and John had drunk his share of seawater, the beast finally let go and swam away, getting ready for a second attack. Seizing the opportunity, John flailed his arms upward, making a mad dash to the surface, where Albert was waiting with a helping hand. He hauled his friend up as far as he could and relied on him to help get himself inside the canoe with him. John was groaning with each movement, and Albert spotted a dark shape under the water, getting closer and closer to the canoe. Thinking quickly, he waited for the shark to break the surface again and slammed his paddle directly onto its snout making it slink back into the water with just enough time for John to pull all his limbs inside the vessel. His leg was torn to shreds, and Albert knew that time was of the essence, so he started turning them around to get them back to the docks, as there was no clinic on the quay. 
Through miraculous luck on their side, there was a small boat with an engine going in their direction as they realized what was happening and rushed over to help. The two men and the woman on the boat helped pull John in, taking care not to make his wounds bleed more than they had to. They quickly found some old gauze in the first aid kit and covered his leg with it and some bandages to hold everything together. He was deathly pale but still responsive, which was the most important. They reached the shore and John was admitted to the local hospital, where he was stabilized and remained for a week, with Albert and his family visiting him frequently. He made a full recovery after a few months of therapy. Bentley had always loved the ocean. He grew up in Florida, and as a child, he spent all of his free time playing in the waves. When he was old enough, he became a lifeguard and began patrolling the beaches he had grown up on. He loved his job, the feeling of saving lives, and the ocean even more. While on duty, Bentley noticed a commotion in the water one day. A man was struggling to stay afloat and yelling for help. Without hesitation, Bentley ran towards the water and dove in. The water was rough that day, and Bentley struggled to reach the man, but he refused to give up. He fought through the waves and eventually reached the man who was now unconscious. Bentley quickly got the man to shore and began performing CPR. He was so focused on saving the man's life that he didn't notice the shadow lurking in the water behind him. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his leg and everything went black briefly. When Bentley woke up, he was in a hospital bed. His leg was bandaged and he was hooked up to machines. He could hear the sound of the ocean outside his window, but he felt a deep fear that he had never felt before. He knew something terrible had happened, but he couldn't remember what. The nurse came into his room and explained what had happened, making him fall unconscious. While he was performing CPR, a shark attacked him. It had bitten his leg and dragged him under the water. Bentley tried to fight it off by kicking the shark's face with his free leg, but it was useless. The shark clung onto his leg like a piece of meat and dragged him to the water. There, he was shaken and thrashed around like a toy, causing him to feel dizzy and weak for a short period. Bentley kept screaming for help, and although he thought he was strong enough to survive, he never thought he could lose all hope in just a split second. He closed his eyes until he heard somebody scream his name. Another lifeguard, Jason, had seen what had happened and had jumped in to save him. Together, they fought off the shark by punching and kicking his face, nose, and gills, and returned to shore. There, Bentley fell unconscious due to the severity of the attack and was rushed to the hospital for immediate medical attention. Bentley was shocked. He had always known that sharks were dangerous in the ocean, but he never thought it would happen to him. He couldn't believe that he had been attacked while doing his job. He felt like he had failed, like he should have been more careful. As he recovered in the hospital, Bentley thought about what had happened. He realized that he had been so focused on saving the man's life that he had forgotten to be aware of his surroundings. He had let his guard down, almost costing him his life. When he was discharged from the hospital, Bentley was determined to get back to work. He knew he couldn't let fear control him and refused to let the shark attack defeat him. He returned to the beach where it had happened and slowly walked into the water. It was terrifying, but he forced himself to stay calm and remember everything he had learned as a lifeguard. As he waded through the waves, Bentley felt his confidence growing. He knew he had been lucky to survive, but he also knew he was stronger than he had ever realized. He had faced his fear and came out the other side. Bentley returned to work as a lifeguard and was more careful than ever before. He made sure to always be aware of his surroundings and never let his guard down. But he also knew that accidents could happen and that he couldn't control everything. A few weeks after he returned to work, Bentley received a letter in the mail. It was from the man he had saved on the day of the shark attack. The man thanked him for saving his life and said he was grateful daily for Bentley's bravery. Reading the letter brought tears to Bentley's eyes. He realized that even though he had been through a traumatic experience, he had also done something incredibly important. He had saved a life, and that was what being a lifeguard was all about. 
Hawaii is one of the world's best and most beautiful tourist attractions, owing to its lush landscapes and extremely appealing waters. Natives consider themselves lucky to live there, and one of those was Emma Marsh, a young woman who found herself face to face with sharp-toothed death. She worked as a dental technician in Hawaii, living on the promenade beside the beach, and frequently went kayaking as a hobby. Emma had always been drawn to the sea. Growing up on the coast, she developed a deep love for the ocean and its wonders. Max, her faithful canine companion, shared her enthusiasm for outdoor adventures. Together, they explored countless beaches and hidden coves, creating treasured memories. Max was a golden retriever and fiercely loyal to his owner. On June 23, 1996, Emma and Max went outside to the beach, where Emma had a kayak handy whenever she felt like paddling out. The kayak was a two-seater, so she strapped Max in for a ride, and he also enjoyed it. The weather was pleasant, and the waves were not harsh, allowing them to go out some distance in peace. She gave Max treats along the way to make him feel more comfortable and calm. Everything was right with the world until Emma felt something sway the kayak up and down aggressively. There was no wave, and she screamed as something bit straight through the body of the small, flimsy kayak and punctured the sides of her legs, drawing blood. The teeth of the monster beneath her were grinding back and forth as it tried to let go and go back beneath the surface. It freed itself from the kayak, and Emma's hands trembled as she fought to maintain her composure legs searing from the puncture wounds. Time seemed to slow down as the predator lunged toward the boat, jaws wide open. Emma's heart leaped into her throat, her adrenaline surging as she made a split-second decision. Max was barking the entire time, teetering on the edge of the kayak, while Emma groaned in pain and tried to steer them to safety. Without any warning, the shark attacked again. It bit into the side of the kayak where Max was, jolting him out of the straps and sending him flying into the water. Emma screamed for him, but he was already in the water, frantically dog-paddling toward her. She outstretched her arms and took him by his paws. Just as she managed to heave him out of the water, the shark broke the surface again, biting Max by the end of his hind leg, but it didn't have enough to land a clean bite. She pulled him in in time and paddled back to shore. The holes in the small kayak were leaking water inside, and time was of the essence, so she paddled with everything she had, all while Max was yelping in pain, shaking in his seat. She somehow managed to cross the 30 yards to the shore, never stopping, and they made it to the shore just in time, just as the water in the kayak was starting to weigh it down and make it sink. In a panic, she snatched Max out of the kayak and rushed him to her backyard, where she could look at his leg. It was cut badly, but there was no severe damage, and he would be okay. A trip to the vet later proved that to be true, and Emma's wounds were also only superficial, although they were close to cutting tendons and arteries. Miraculously, none of that happened. The pair was on the mend for a few weeks following the incident as Emma could barely get Max outside, let alone into the water. He never did get over his fear of the ocean, and Emma never wanted to subject him to that trauma again. The story is set in the great state of Florida in the United States. Aside from California, the Sunshine State, Florida, houses some of the most beautiful nature and wildlife, but it also comes with a risk. Animals in Florida tend to be quite aggressive when provoked, which Clyde Millet would find out when he found himself in front of the jaws of a hungry great white shark. For context, Clyde was selected as one of the winners of a complimentary scuba diving course off the coast of Jacksonville. He was a teenager and originally from Jacksonville, so he felt fairly relaxed in the water and jumped at the opportunity immediately. The course was supposed to be held two weeks from the announcement so Clyde was a little nervous as the team was taking them further away from shore than he had ever been. When the day of the course came, Clyde was sitting in his room, contemplating whether he should go. Anxiety and nerves were getting to him, as his mood when he accepted the course had fizzled away. 
and his head was filled with what-ifs and possible outcomes. His mother, Teresa, urged him to attend the course anyway, since it was a good opportunity to experience something new. He pulled himself together and gathered his things and rushed to the beach as he was late. He got to the meeting point within 20 minutes and was greeted by a familiar sight. A group of six people was standing next to a huge boat, conversing with themselves, but their attention turned to Clyde as one of the instructors raised his arms in the air and exclaimed, There he is! with a smile. As Clyde neared the group, they moved toward him, and one of the instructors slapped him on the pack and asked him if he was late because he was nervous. He nodded, and the charismatic instructor told him that everything would be all right, and to make a point, Clyde would be the first to dive that day. This would prove to be a mistake. They made their way to the boat. All in all, there were six of them, two instructors and three people aside from Clyde. One was a middle-aged lady working as a nurse in the nearby hospital. One was college-aged and studying English. And one worked as an accountant in Jacksonville. All of them were eager to head out on the water and enjoy the experience, and they all talked to Clyde in a friendly manner to get him to relax. In the end, he got more comfortable on the boat and was looking forward to his first dive. It took them about 15 minutes to get to their diving point after which they donned their scuba gear and were ready for the dive. It took Clyde little time to figure out how the suit was supposed to be put on, and the instructor helped him put on his tank and respirator. He talked him through the dive process and what he would do when he got in. Clyde nodded and let himself fall backward into the ocean, with the instructor following him closely. As soon as he was in the water, Clyde opened his eyes to see the deepest blue he had ever seen and the chasm of nothingness he could not have imagined. There was no visible bottom, save for some suggestion of a coral reef and flora further than Clyde could see. A hand touched him on the shoulder, and he flinched, but he was relieved to see his instructor's face smiling through his respirator. He pointed some ways into the distance, and the two swam there to observe some marine life. The other instructor was tending to the rest of the group individually. As they swam forward, visibility improved, and Clyde could finally see the mass of fish and life sprawling through the water. He described it as everything he imagined whenever he thought of the ocean, and said he never regretted seeing it. They swam for a few minutes, taking in the sights, with the instructor looking at Clyde frequently with an I told you so look in his eyes. As the minutes ticked by, Clyde felt more and more free in the water, so he swam deeper and deeper into the depths. The instructor followed him, given his newfound confidence. The marine life bustled the further they dove, but Clyde couldn't shake a feeling of ambiguous unease. He felt as if he was being watched, but couldn't explain it. He turned to the instructor and signaled that he would like them to surface, giving him an enthusiastic thumbs up. They started swimming upwards, but something in Clyde's gut told him to look down. From the murk, a massive shark was swimming through the kelp straight for them. Clyde kicked upwards, jabbing his instructor in the ribs, and then pointed down. His eyes widened, and he firmly grasped Clyde under his arm, and they kicked toward the surface firmly. Clyde did not dare look back until he felt the shark distorting the water around him. It caught up to them. The shark bit into Clyde's leg with everything it had. He accidentally let the respirator fall from his mouth as he tried to let out a scream, and the grimace he made loosened the mask covering his eyes. He was now blind, without air, and being pulled through the water as his legs seared with pain. It quickly subsided, however, since sharks often take hold of their prey and let go to get multiple bites in. The instructor had just caught up when the shark let go of Clyde and surged through the water. He pulled him by the arm and kicked toward the surface with everything he had, leaving a trail of blood in their wake. The boat was getting closer and closer. They managed to surface, and Clyde took a massive breath mixed with salt water. Coughing, he took the hands of the other instructor, who had just finished loading the rest of the group into the boat. He fell to the boat's deck and screamed in pain as the broken bones and severed tendons in his legs shifted, held together only by the skin on his leg. The nurse on the boat tried to patch him up with a first aid kit on the boat, but Clyde was still bleeding. 
Clyde's instructor barely managed to get back on the boat before the shark's massive maw crashed through the surface after him. As soon as he jumped into the boat, he ran to the engine, steered them toward the shore, and sped up. After that, he knelt beside Clyde and talked to him to ensure he was stable and conscious. He was moaning through the pain, but he would pull through. After an emergency room visit and a few weeks of recovery later, Clyde contacted his instructor again, saying that he didn't blame him for the incident, as it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience he would happily go through again if it meant seeing the ocean in such a scope. He recovered completely and found a passion for deep-sea diving, albeit chainmail was a new mandatory equipment. On a warm summer evening, an unforeseen tragedy unfolded aboard a luxurious cruise ship sailing through the Mediterranean Sea. Sarah Thompson, a young woman passionate about adventure, was in a terrifying situation after accidentally falling overboard into the dark, unforgiving waters. Sarah had always dreamed of exploring the world and had saved diligently for this once-in-a-lifetime cruise. It took her years to save enough money with her husband, Elliot, to embark on that trip, and it was everything they had hoped for and more. The voyage was meant to celebrate her graduation from university, a reward for years of hard work. As the sun began to set on that fateful evening, Sarah found herself leaning against the ship's railing, lost in thought as she gazed out at the vast expanse of the Mediterranean. She could hear people walking and talking around her, but she only focused on the limitless sea expanse before her. In that moment of distraction, Sarah leaned on the railing, looking down, but failed to notice the rail bending under her weight before creaking and snapping at the joining point. It was rusted beyond repair. Sarah went over the edge and somehow managed to grab onto the rail, still attached to the rest of the boat, but only for a moment before her grip faltered and she tumbled to the murky depths. A man ran up to the rail to help her, but he was too late. People screamed and panicked as they looked at her in the water, asking boat officials to rush to her aid. Elliot was on the deck just below Sarah, holding onto the rail, screaming after her. He tried to jump across the rail and help his wife, but one of the crewmates held him back, warning against the dangers of getting caught in the current. Chaos and disbelief rippled through the vessel as everyone grappled with the suddenness of the situation. Due to being under-equipped for the task, the crew could do nothing more than throw a life jacket in Sarah's direction and ready a boat to go after her, but she was already floating outside their possible reach. Elliot screamed after her, which only got more intense as he saw Sarah suddenly cry out and the water underneath her turned a dark shade of red. She screamed for a moment before she was pulled underneath the surface, and the image of a large tail fin came into view. They realized what had happened. Elliot fell to the ground, shaking, unable to comprehend what had happened to his wife in such a short period. The ship's crew took him to the infirmary, while others called the Coast Guard to look for Sarah, who was nowhere to be seen. The ship was anchored prematurely while the Coast Guard could establish what had happened and what they would do to control the situation. After their vessels arrived at the scene, the cruise ship was sent to the nearest port, and after two days of searching, they concluded that Sarah's body could not be found. This crushed Elliot, who struggled to deal with the grief and loss for years. Chase is a young man who had always dreamed of visiting Hawaii. He had heard stories of the stunning beaches, crystal clear waters, and exhilarating water sports. He couldn't tour the beautiful place since he was busy being an intelligent student. When the opportunity finally presented itself when he got a summer break from the university, he jumped at the chance. He arrived in Hawaii with his family and they immediately explored the island. They spent the first few days lounging on the beach, trying different foods and soaking up the local culture. But Chase was eager to try his hand at some of Hawaii's more adventurous activities. So on the fourth day of their trip, he decided to rent a jet ski and explore the waters. Chase was a skilled jet skier and he was having the time of his life as he raced across the waves. He admired the breathtaking scenery when something suddenly brushed against his leg. At first, 
Chase thought it was just seaweed, but when he looked down, he saw a large shark swimming beside him. He panicked and tried to speed away, but the shark was too fast. The shark jumped out of the water in seconds and clamped down on Chase's leg. Chase screamed in agony as the shark dragged him through the water. He could feel its teeth tearing into his flesh, knowing he was in grave danger. He struggled to stay afloat, desperately trying to free himself from the shark's grip. He tried to punch the shark in its face and kick it with his free leg, but it was useless. Chase had no match for the shark's strength, and he knew his leg might be torn apart at any second now. Blood could now be seen in the waters as he struggled to stay still while the shark shook and thrashed him around the water like a light object. He was desperately crying and screaming for help, and he knew his life could be taken away from him anytime soon if help didn't come his way. Just when he thought all hope was lost, a local fisherman named Akamu appeared out of nowhere. Akamu had been fishing when he saw the commotion and rushed over to see what was happening. Akamu jumped into the water without hesitation and began hitting the shark with his fishing rod. The shark was flinching due to Akamu's attacks, as Akamu also punched the shark in its eyes, nose, and gills to deter it from Chase. The shark eventually released its grip on Chase's leg and started to bite Akamu's arm, but Akamu was too quick and groped into the shark's gills tightly, causing the animal to get hurt and swim away in an instant. Akamu helped Chase onto the jet ski and raced him back to shore. The attack had left Chase with multiple wounds on his leg, bleeding profusely. Akamu called for an ambulance and Chase was rushed to the hospital. Chase underwent emergency surgery and the doctor saved his leg, but he was left with scars that would remind him of the terrifying experience for the rest of his life. Despite his trauma, Chase was grateful to Akamu for saving his life. He wanted to thank him properly and learn more about the man who had risked his life to save a stranger. Chase eventually tracked Akamu down and invited him to dinner. Akamu agreed, and the two men spent the evening talking about their lives and experiences. Chase learned that Akamu had grown up in Hawaii and had spent his entire life fishing and exploring the island's waters. He was an expert fisherman and had even won several local fishing competitions. As they talked, Chase realized that he had never met someone so passionate about the ocean and the creatures that inhabited it. Akamu deeply respected nature and spent his life studying and exploring the ocean's wonders. Chase left Hawaii with a newfound appreciation for the beauty and power of the ocean. He also left with a deep respect for the locals who had grown up on the island and had a deep connection to the sea. The experience had been terrifying but also taught him a valuable lesson. He realized that life was unpredictable and that one never knew what the next moment would bring. But he also learned that good people in the world, like Akamu, were willing to risk their lives to help a stranger. Chase returned home with a renewed sense of gratitude and a determination to live life to the fullest. He would never forget the terrifying experience in Hawaii, but he would also never forget the kindness and bravery of the man who had saved his life. Demi had always been a loving and protective mother to her five-year-old son, Marcus. They were inseparable, and their bond was unbreakable. Florida's warm, sunny beaches were their favorite getaway, where they would spend countless hours building sandcastles, splashing in the gentle waves, and creating memories that would last a lifetime. On a seemingly ordinary day, Demi and Marcus arrived at their favorite beach, brimming with excitement. The sun shone brightly overhead, casting a golden glow on the pristine sand. Marcus couldn't contain his enthusiasm and immediately ran towards the water, his laughter echoing. Demi settled onto a beach towel, her eyes never straying far from her son. She watched as he frolicked in the shallow water, his tiny feet sinking into the wet sand. But unbeknownst to them, danger lurked beneath the surface waiting patiently. Suddenly, as if emerging from a nightmare, a massive shark appeared out of nowhere. It launched itself toward Marcus, its jaws gaping wide, ready to claim its unsuspecting prey. 
Time seemed to stand still as Demi's maternal instincts kicked into overdrive. Without hesitation, Demi charged toward the shark, a primal roar escaping her lips. She threw herself between the predator and her son, absorbing the full force of the attack. The shark's razor-sharp teeth tore into her flesh, its strength overwhelming. Demi's blood mingled with the salt water as she fought valiantly to protect Marcus. A nearby lifeguard named Ethan witnessed the horrifying scene unfolding before him. Reacting swiftly, he blew his whistle, alerting his fellow lifeguards and beachgoers of the imminent danger. He dove into the water, racing towards Demi and Marcus, his heart pounding with adrenaline. Meanwhile, another lifeguard named Olivia sprinted from her post towards the water's edge, armed with a rescue buoy. She knew time was of the essence. As Ethan reached Demi and Marcus, he grabbed the struggling mother, determined to free her from the shark's clutches. Ethan and Olivia worked perfectly synchronously, pulling Demi and Marcus to safety. As the trio emerged from the water, the beach erupted into chaos. Bystanders gasped in horror at seeing Demi's mangled body, her blood staining the sand. Paramedics arrived swiftly, whisking Demi away on a stretcher, fighting to stabilize her fragile condition. News of Demi's selfless act spread like wildfire throughout the community. The tight-knit beach town rallied around her, offering support, prayers, and well wishes for her recovery. Cards and flowers flooded her hospital room, constantly reminding her of the love and compassion that surrounded her. As weeks stretched into months, Demi engaged in a relentless battle to heal her physical and emotional wounds. With unwavering dedication, surgeons worked tirelessly to reconstruct her torn flesh, while therapists guided her through the arduous rehabilitation process. Marcus stood firmly by her side through every step, radiating strength and hope as a steadfast beacon. Finally, the day came when Demi was deemed well enough to return home. It was a moment of triumph, a testament to her indomitable spirit and the power of love. The community honored the lifeguards, Ethan and Olivia, for their heroic efforts that had saved Demi's life. Demi's story became an inspiration to all who heard it, a reminder of the lengths a mother would go to to protect her child. She dedicated her life to raising awareness about shark conservation, sharing her harrowing experience as a cautionary tale. Her resilience and unwavering love for Marcus touched hearts far and wide. Our next story takes us to Boa Viagem, Brazil, where Natasha Volkov, a Russian tourist, visited Boa Viagem in the summer of 1998 as a vacation from her stressful job as a nurse in Vladivostok. She was 28 years old, and accompanying her on the trip was her boyfriend, Ilya, who worked as a welder. The two met when Ilya accompanied his friend to the hospital after he burned his hand on some welding equipment. They talked after his friend was taken care of and eventually started dating. The weather in Boa Viagem was terrible during their stay. For the first four days of their one-week vacation, they had a lot of rain that made going outside quite unpleasant, so they just went to restaurants and stayed inside, relaxing. However, on the last three days of their stay, the weather cleared up and presented them with high temperatures and plenty of sun to go to the beach. Natasha was excited to go to the beach, and Ilya shared her enthusiasm. They made it to the beach, and Natasha noticed that a vendor was selling floating mattresses, so she bought one and decided she would float in the water for most of the day and enjoy her time off. Ilya helped his girlfriend blow the mattress up, and decided to read a book in the shade and then walk around and have a beer. The water was cold when she entered it since it was still early, around 9 a.m. The couple wanted to maximize their beach time, so they arrived early. Lounging around on the mattress was pure bliss for Natasha, so much so she ended up dozing off and drifted away from shore for a considerable distance. She opened her eyes to a kaleidoscope of colors shifting in her vision due to the intense sunlight, and she realized she had drifted a few hundred yards away from the shore. 
After the initial wave of panic subsided, she realized that she was on a mattress after all, so she could paddle her way back to the shore with her arms. She even took this as another opportunity to relax, as the sun's heat felt quite nice on her back. This is the point where things went wrong for Natasha Volkov. Something to note about most shark species is that they are quite observant and tend to spot shapes when they are hunting. So the shape of something floating on the surface of the water can be something like a seal or an unknowing woman relaxing. As Natasha got within a hundred yards of shore, she noticed movement underneath her mattress, which caused her to worry. She paddled faster. After a few moments, she felt a strong force bump into her stomach, lifting her about a foot into the air. She yelped in surprise and tried to paddle even faster, but it was in vain. Her mattress was punctured. It started leaking air into the water quickly, and Natasha lost speed. As the surface of the mattress started falling below the surface of the water, Natasha looked up to see the populated beach and its tourists minding their own business. She started crying as she realized that no one knew what was happening and no one was coming to help anytime soon. Her face reached the water and her attacker's presence was made clear by a single thing, a dorsal fin. She saw the bull shark zip past her and a bit further away, so she started flailing and screaming as she swam to shore with everything she had. Some people took notice and pointed Natasha out to the lifeguard on the beach who immediately ran in and started swimming in her direction. She was still some 70 yards away from shore, but her progress was impeded by a searing pain in her right side. The shark had circled and came back to bump into her again. The shark's rough skin caused Natasha to bleed into the water. Not much, but this is a shark we're talking about. The scent of blood in the water heightened the shark's sense of smell, making it more determined and hungry. Seconds later, Natasha felt the shark bite into her thigh, just above her knee, and pull her under the surface. The shark flailed and thrashed as it held Natasha in place, and she exhausted most of her precious breath screaming underwater, so each second was valuable. She tried pushing the shark away from her leg, but it was not letting go. In utter desperation, she started gouging its eyes, scratching them, but that only made her hands bleed. It wasn't until she moved her hands down and pulled the shark's gills that it finally let go of her leg. After one last convulsion, the beast surged past Natasha once more, skidding across her belly and making her bleed even more. By this time, the lifeguard had finally made his way to the victim and pulled her back to the surface. Natasha breathed life back into her lungs and screamed immediately afterward, but the lifeguard held her close and told her to calm down and to hold on to him. He turned and started swimming back to shore quickly, as he understood that time was of the essence and that the shark could have been back at any second. They returned to the shore within a few minutes and Natasha began feeling dizzy due to blood loss. They laid her down and the lifeguard assessed her wounds and decided she needed an ambulance. One was called by a bystander as soon as they saw Natasha's wounds so the sirens could be heard in the distance. During this time, Ilya was walking back to their bags on the beach when he heard the commotion and noticed his girlfriend was attacked by something. He dropped his things and immediately ran to help her, pushing through the crowd and helping her stay steady while the ambulance arrived. It got there in a few minutes and Natasha was swiftly taken to the nearest hospital and her wounds were tended to. It took her a few hours to stabilize, after which Ilya apologized profusely for not being there to save her from the beast. Natasha remarked that she knew he couldn't swim and didn't want to go into the water. He sat with her for the entirety of her recovery and provided all the support he could, even though she got to walk normally again. He accompanied her to every therapy session and stuck with her to the end, eventually leading to their marriage a few years later. Tom Brook had always been fascinated by the ocean. He read many books on marine biology and similar topics in his teenage years. Further education on the topic was limited, so the next best thing for Tom was to take up an interest in surfing. 
He frequently spent his weekends hitting waves with his friends, spending hours in the water surfing and snorkeling. On August 18, 2012, Tom went to the usual beach he and his friends would frequent to have fun. They met up in the morning and planned to swim, eat food, then return to surfing for the rest of the day. When they first entered the water, Tom noted that he didn't feel like his usual self. He felt flush and disoriented, so he lounged on the beach until he felt better. His friends agreed, so they swam around a bit before accompanying their friend to a nearby restaurant to make him feel better. Some friendly banter and pasta later, Tom felt himself again and wanted to start surfing as soon as possible. They got their surfboards ready and paddled a few hundred yards from the beach. Catching waves as a surfer often entails sitting on your board, waiting for the wave to build up to catch it, so that's what they did. Tom noticed his friends were already on a wave while waiting, so he cheered them on. He remained sitting on his board, admiring the agility of his friends and how good they were at surfing. The calm water sloshed around him, and he expected a wave to start forming. But his excitement turned to horror as he looked to the side to see a dorsal fin sticking out of the water, followed by the giant mouth of a bull shark that bit into his leg. He screamed and lost his balance, causing him to flip into the water and get thrown around by the shark. Bull sharks are notorious for being aggressive and persistent with their food, so this was just the tip of the iceberg for Tom. His friends heard the scream and quickly started paddling to his aid, but they were still far off. In excruciating pain, Tom was still under the water, eyes burning because of the salt. The shark was not letting go. He tried to flail around and gouge its eyes, but it was still not giving up. In fact, it seemed as though it only made the shark angrier. By that point, one of the friends arrived at the scene, thrust his hand under the surface and clutched Tom with everything he had. He started pulling while Tom pushed the shark off his leg, and they miraculously managed to get Tom on his friend's board. They both knelt on the board, panting, with Tom moaning in pain. His leg was searing with pain and bleeding profusely. His muscles were ripped and tendons were torn, but Tom insisted on getting to shore as soon as possible. He didn't tell his friend, but he started losing consciousness. They reached the beach in a few minutes to a crowd of onlookers curious about the screaming. His friend helped him stand on one leg while he screamed for someone to call an ambulance. Tom's other friend rushed over and told them that he had already called an ambulance a few minutes away. When he saw the commotion, he swam back to shore to preemptively call emergency services. Thankfully, the ambulance did arrive right on time. The paramedics rushed out and assessed the situation with one of them immediately attending to Tom's wounds to stop the bleeding and stabilize him. It only took him a few minutes, but in the end, they took Tom into the ambulance along with his friends. On the way there, the paramedic told the young men they were brave for doing what they did and that Tom would be fine despite his blood loss. The paramedic was friendly and even cracked a few jokes that eased the tension. When they arrived at the hospital, the paramedics said they would admit him into their care and that the boys could either come back later to check on him or sit in the waiting room. They chose the latter. Eventually, they were informed that Tom was okay and would be released the following day. They helped him get back home with his family and supported him through his recuperation period. He never lost his love for the ocean or surfing, and he understood that the shark was acting on instinct and did not blame it for what happened. In his later years, Tom ended up steering his education toward marine biology, making it his major in college. Thailand is a place with a very wide variety of sharks, some of which can prove to be a nuisance for people just trying to get by be it by being a constant threat to the populace, by finding themselves where they should not be, or just by attacking people, even if unprovoked, although that scenario is much rarer. Our next story is about Ankali Sakta, a native of the island of Pukwak off the southeast coast of Cambodia. She lived in a small village on the island with her husband and infant daughter. They belonged to the lower class when it came to income, so they mostly got by by doing menial labor to support themselves. 
One day, as Ankali was getting ready to leave to attend to her household chores, her husband stopped by the house and asked them to take a stroll by the beach to relax. She agreed, and they went on their way. It didn't take long, the walk was less than 20 minutes. They took their daughter along, as there was no one there to take care of her. Her name was Ayali. As they got to the beach, they noticed that quite a few people were there, and it was crowded, and Ayali was getting nervous so they decided to walk more inland through the forest connected to the beach. The shade provided refreshment and comfort, and they had a pleasant conversation while they walked along a river. At some point, they noticed that the bridge usually there had collapsed for unknown reasons, so they elected to wade through the water as it was slightly below waist height. At the halfway point of the river, Ankali felt something bite her leg, causing her to lose balance and fall into the water. As she did, she felt disoriented as she breathed in water, but her husband quickly pulled her up and onto her feet. She couldn't hear anything except for some muffled screaming. When her head cleared, she realized that the one screaming was her husband, and she was no longer holding Ayali. He was asking her where their daughter was, and they both noticed redness in the water, upon which he dove down and resurfaced, holding a bloody mess in the clothes that Ayali was wearing. Their daughter was gone. Some people nearby heard the commotion and rushed to help, but nothing could be done. One reported seeing a small white-tipped shark swim down the river back toward the ocean. They were amazed that a shark might wander up the river as they had never been spotted there, and that river was where children often came to swim and have fun. The bystanders tried to help calm Ankali down, but it was pointless. She remained on the side of the river, wailing for the better part of an hour. They returned to their house and had a funeral for their daughter a few days later. No one ever swam in that river again. On June 17, 2023, an adventurous traveler, Mark Stevens, embarked on a trip to Koh Tao, a picturesque island in Thailand known for its tranquil beaches and abundant marine life. Little did he know that this journey would become a fight for survival against a group of relentless predators. On a sunny morning, Mark set out for a solo diving expedition near a popular spot for diving enthusiasts due to its rich biodiversity. He was a free diver, relying on a single breath to explore as much as he wanted and would surface once every five minutes. As he descended deeper into the abyss, the underwater world revealed its enchanting beauty. Vibrant corals swayed gently, teeming with an array of colorful fish. The silence of the deep was occasionally broken by the distant sound of underwater creatures. Suddenly, a surge of movement caught Mark's attention. He turned his head to see nothing aside from movement in the kelp around him, but he was still unnerved. He decided that he would slowly start to swim back up to the surface. And as he got closer, he took another look behind himself to see something that would remain seared into his memory forever. Two black tip reef sharks were approaching him, their dead eyes unmoving. With each passing moment, the sharks grew bolder, circling closer and testing the waters. Mark's heart raced as adrenaline coursed through his veins. He realized that escape was impossible and had to rely on his instincts and training to survive this life-or-death situation. He started wildly swimming toward the surface, his lungs burning from stress and overexertion. As he finally broke the surface, he grabbed hold of the small dock where he had left his gear and went to pull himself up when he felt two massive jolts of pain shoot through his legs. The sharks had caught up to him and they latched onto his legs, one onto his thigh and one his ankle. The pain ripped through his nerves as the shark on his thigh slid across his flesh, flaying his leg open and releasing a red mist around the small dock. He screamed with everything he had and tried to pull himself up, but the sharks were too heavy. Finally, after a tense moment, the shark gripping his thigh released its hold allowing him to pull himself onto the dock. The rough weathered wood scraped against his wound, causing him to groan in even more discomfort. He saw his legs ripped to shreds as he lay on the dock, bleeding profusely. 
Feeling like losing consciousness, he released one last scream and passed out. Much to his surprise, he later woke up inside an ambulance, with several medics tending to his wounds. Heavily medicated and loopy, he lost consciousness again before waking up hours later in the hospital with his wife by his side. She was crying, but thankful that he had survived. His wounds were debilitating and took months of recovery, but he could walk comfortably again. Mia Ellis and Emily Mullen, two best friends with an insatiable thirst for adventure, found themselves on a remote island in the heart of the South Pacific. They were on their fifth vacation day, having arrived from Germany, looking to enjoy the sights and gain some new memories. Surrounded by crystal clear waters and pristine beaches, it was the perfect setting for lounging around in the blistering heat. Little did they know that their latest adventure would take an unexpected and terrifying turn. With their surfboards in hand, Mia and Emily headed to a secluded cove known for being a comfort to any tourist. They had never surfed before and didn't intend to, instead planning to lie on the surfboards and float in the water. Surfing was an activity that never sat well with them. As they paddled out, the sun danced on the water creating a mesmerizing kaleidoscope of colors. They commented on how pleasant the ocean was, with its crystal clear water and excellent temperature. Mia and Emily dove into the waves sporadically whenever they would get dry from the sun. Through conversation and swimming, they thought that truly nothing could go wrong. That was until one of them noticed a dark shape underneath the water's surface, darting around with concerning speed Emily was the first one to speak and warned Mia to get back onto her surfboard. A chill ran down their spines as they realized the severity of the situation. Panic coursed through their veins, fueling their desperate fight-or-flight response. The predator was closing in, its powerful presence growing more palpable with each passing second. Mia managed to climb back onto her board. With adrenaline surging, Mia and Emily turned toward the shore their hearts pounding with the crashing waves. They kicked and thrashed, propelled by an instinctual survival drive. The shark followed closely behind, its dorsal fin poking through the surface. The shark was bound to be faster, as fast as they perceived themselves. It made its move. It lunged towards Mia, its jaw snapping perilously close to her leg. It missed her leg, but latched onto the surfboard, tilting it at a dangerous angle and leaving Mia on the brink of falling into the water. Mia acted on instinct, raising her leg high up in the air and bashing the shark on the nose, making it immediately let go of the board and slink back into the water. The predator recoiled, momentarily disoriented. Mia seized the opportunity, turning on her side and paddling with everything she had, her heart racing with fear and hope. Emily followed suit, her unwavering determination pushing her beyond her limits. The shark, while dazed, did not stop its pursuit. It swam behind them, but never managed to catch up as the pair had already reached the shallows, and they were safe. They had narrowly escaped the jaws of death and were left sitting on the beach, panting, muscles burning, stunned, and unable to form sentences. They saw the shark retreat into the depths. Mia's foot was badly scratched up due to the shark's coarse skin, but it was nothing compared to what could have been lost. They left for home the same day, never telling anyone what had happened. John Donovan stood at the edge of the pristine beach, his bare feet sinking into the warm sand. The sun was high, casting a golden hue over the sparkling turquoise waters. John was an adventurous soul, always seeking thrill and excitement in his travels around the world. He had arrived at this remote tropical destination, lured by the promise of untouched beauty and legendary waves. Little did John know that fate had a chilling encounter in store for him, one that would forever alter his perception of the ocean's depths. As he prepared his surfboard, memories of his childhood riding the waves flooded his mind. He had always felt an unexplainable connection to the sea, an affinity that drew him like a magnetic force. 
As a young man, he would use any excuse to swim and surf whenever possible. At that point, he had been on that beach for a few days, camping and enjoying his free time. He was a hobbyist surfer and taught guitar in a local youth center. With exhilaration, John paddled out into the azure expanse, his heart pounding with anticipation. The waves rose and fell in a mesmerizing rhythm, taking him back to his childhood. An experienced surfer, John reveled in the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline coursing through his veins. As he rode wave after wave, a subtle shift in the atmosphere sent a shiver down his spine. The air became charged with an inexplicable tension. He was lying face down on his board, paddling forward, unaware of the terror below him. A bull shark, it was later established, was eyeing John and intending to strike. Unseen by John, the monstrous creature closed in with ruthless precision. Its powerful body sliced through the water, propelled by an insatiable appetite. The shark lunged from below, its jaws clamping down on John's leg with a bone-crushing force. Agonizing pain seared through his body, eclipsing all rational thought. The world turned upside down as John fought desperately for his life. He thrashed and kicked, his mind consumed by a primal survival instinct. Blood clouded the water around him. He was forcibly pulled from his surfboard and under the surface. He opened his eyes and saw the beast clamping down on his leg. With every ounce of strength left within him, John clawed at the shark's eyes, hoping to blind the beast and buy himself a few precious seconds of respite. The struggle beneath the waves was a relentless battle of wills. John's vision blurred, his body weakening with each passing moment, but he refused to succumb fueled by an indomitable spirit and an unwavering determination to survive. As expected, his gouging the shark's eyes did nothing to stop it, making it only angrier. Desperately thinking, he thrust his arms as far out in front of himself as possible, grabbing the shark's gills and pulling with everything he had. It thrashed more, sending waves of electric pain in John's body but its jaws weren't as tight as before, allowing John to seize the opportunity. In a final act of defiance, John summoned his last reserves of strength. With a mighty surge, he freed himself from the shark's grip, leaving a trail of flesh and agony in its wake. He propelled himself upward, desperate for air, praying that the shark would not recover too quickly. Gasping for life-giving oxygen, John broke through the surface, his body battered and broken. His leg was mangled, torn apart by the relentless force of the shark's assault. Blood trailed behind him, a grim testament to his harrowing encounter. He grabbed his surfboard and hauled himself up, paddling wildly to get to the shore. Before long, he was in the shallows where he could stand up and hobble to solid ground, seeing the shark's dorsal fin in the distance. As he lay on the sandy shore, pain pulsating through every nerve, John knew he had narrowly escaped the clutches of death. The ocean, which he had trusted before and felt safe inside, had become something to dread. His leg was bleeding, but luckily some bystanders ran to the shore when they saw the shark attack him. In the days and weeks that followed, John embarked on a grueling physical and emotional recovery journey. Each step was hard but necessary because he was determined not to let a shark change the course of his life for the worst. Eventually, he fully recovered and retained motor functions in his leg. Mary had always been fascinated by sharks. From a young age, she immersed herself in books, documentaries, and online forums dedicated to these magnificent creatures. Over time, her admiration transformed into a deep passion for their conservation. Mary dedicated her life to raising awareness about protecting sharks and their habitats. She became a prominent advocate for these misunderstood predators. One sunny afternoon, Mary found herself in the crystal clear waters of a tropical paradise. She had traveled to a remote island known for its vibrant marine life, including a healthy population of sharks. With her knowledge and a desire to experience these creatures up close, Mary donned her wetsuit and slipped into the water. 
As Mary gracefully swam among the sharks, she marveled at their elegance. It was a magical experience for her, being so close to the animals she had spent years studying and defending. She swam gently, always mindful of the boundaries between her and the sharks. However, in a momentary lapse of judgment, Mary made a mistake. She touched one of the sharks, thinking it would be a brief and harmless interaction. To her horror, the shark reacted with sudden aggression. It instantly turned on her, its razor-sharp teeth sinking into her flesh. Pain shot through Mary's body as the shark thrashed and shook her violently. Blood clouded the water, creating a gruesome to blow. Mary fought to stay conscious, desperately hoping that help would arrive. Just as Mary lost hope, a figure emerged from the deep. It was Olive, another shark advocate and experienced diver. Olive had been observing the interaction from a distance and swiftly sprung into action when she realized Mary was in danger. Without hesitation, Olive swam towards the ferocious shark, brandishing a long pole with a small spear-like tip. She knew she had to act decisively to save her friend. With skill precision, Olive struck the shark's sensitive gills, causing it to release its grip on Mary. Bloodied and weakened, Mary clung to consciousness as Olive swiftly pulled her toward the surface. Olive's calm presence and quick thinking were a lifeline in those dark moments. With every ounce of strength she had left, Mary kicked her legs, propelling herself upward. Emerging from the water, Mary was greeted by a team of divers alerted by Olive's distress call. They rushed her onto a boat, applying first aid and doing their best to stem the bleeding. Despite the pain and shock, Mary felt a surge of gratitude for Olive's courage and selflessness. Mary was airlifted to a nearby hospital where a team of skilled surgeons worked tirelessly to repair her torn flesh. As she lay in the hospital bed, her body slowly healing, Mary reflected on the ordeal. She knew that her passion for shark conservation would not waver. In fact, her experience had only deepened her commitment to protecting these creatures and educating others about their crucial role in the ecosystem. Months later, Mary emerged stronger and more determined from her recovery than ever. She resumed her advocacy work with renewed vigor, sharing her story of survival and the importance of respecting sharks' boundaries. Together with Olive, they embarked on a mission to educate divers and swimmers about responsible interactions with marine life. Mary's brush with death transformed her into a beacon of resilience and inspiration. She became a voice for those who couldn't speak for themselves and continued to fight for the conservation of sharks, ensuring that her own harrowing encounter would never be forgotten. Coastal waters in the summer are the go-to locations for tourists and divers to go and enjoy themselves, be it on vacation or on a day-to-day -day basis. However, not all vacation destinations are entirely safe, as you have a variety of sea creatures that can kill you with one touch, take entire limbs, and leave you scarred for life. We have three of the most terrifying accounts of everyday people coming across sharks of all species out in the wild, and none have a good outcome. The first story we'll talk about Max Enfield, a 14-year-old diver who found himself face to face with the greatest terror of the sea, the great white shark. Story 1 It was a warm summer day in Cape Town, South Africa and 14-year-old diver Max Enfield was eagerly getting ready to explore the depths of False Bay. Max was introduced to scuba diving by his father, Marcin, when he was 10 years old, so he was not short on experience in the water. His father always accompanied him as it was their way of bonding and having fun in their free time. The day that Max's diving career would come to a screeching halt was June 11, 2005 when he would find himself in the ocean's depths with one of the most dangerous predators imaginable, a great white shark. His and his father's day was going quite well, with Max being free from school and his father's job easing up on the workload, giving him more free time. They decided to head for the beach around 11 a.m., 
and explore some marine life like they always did. They had a tradition of looking for unique shells or anything interesting. Whoever found the best shell wouldn't have to cook dinner when they returned. Mex rarely won, but it was the experience that made it worthwhile. As the pair neared their usual meeting point, they spotted a group of novice scuba divers preparing for their first class. They seemed friendly, so Max's father asked them if they could join the class and provide insight into how to get the most out of diving. The nervous novice divers visibly became more comfortable, and the two instructors were happy to take them up on their offer. They made their acquaintance and helped them load the gear onto the boat. The mood was pleasant, and the pair enjoyed spending time with fellow divers. They would take a boat to Seal Island to see some unique wildlife. There were seven people, including Max and his father, and things seemed to be going quite well. Max and Marcine dove into the water first to demonstrate to the group what they have to do, and then they went off to explore while the instructors conducted their lesson. The pair was experienced, true, but they didn't need to all be there to help the newbies. As the pair enjoyed sights like these every week, but it never got old, and each dive was just as amazing as the first. Max looked around, determined to find something impressive to show his father. As his gaze moved along the ocean floor, he spotted something shining at the bottom and thought it would be his best find ever. He pointed to the bottom to Marcin, just so he knew where he would be, to which his father gave him a thumbs up. As Max got deeper and deeper into the water, he felt it getting colder, but he was determined to reach his goal. Through the kelp, he spied the object and reached it after a few minutes. The shine the object was letting off gave him the certainty that he would finally beat his father in their scavenger hunt game. He thrust his hand into the mud and sand and pulled out his prize. It was a piece of glass, a useless piece of glass. He sighed internally and flipped himself over to float in his disappointment. When he opened his eyes again, he was met with a sight that would haunt him forever. The sight of a giant great white shark's maw getting closer and closer to him. He flipped back around in his panic, but the shark was far too fast. Its jaws clamped around his shoulder and the oxygen tank on his back, bursting it. The respirator was blown out of his mouth, and he let out a scream, but it was lost in the water around him. The pain was horrible, worse than anything Max had ever felt. He thought of escaping that situation, but the pain inhibited his thoughts. All he could do was wriggle and try to fight off the shark. Just as he was starting to lose consciousness, he saw something surge in front of him, only to see the determined face of his father, who saw what was going on and rushed to Max's rescue. He quickly thrust his hand into the shark's gills to get it to let go of his son, and thankfully, it worked. Knowing that time was of the essence, Marcin grabbed Max and started kicking to the surface with everything he had. His legs were burning with the effort, but nothing else mattered except ensuring his son was safe. They left a trail of blood in their wake as they ascended. After about a minute, they breached the surface and both screamed for help, much to the horror of the other instructors explaining the equipment to the new divers. Deathly pale, they hauled Max into the boat and set him down on the deck, with Marcin following closely. He pushed the two men aside and knelt behind Max, who was bleeding. The bleeding was profuse, and Max felt weaker with each passing second. Marcin told the instructors to turn the boat on and rush them to the nearest town, which they immediately did. Marcin put pressure on Max's wounds and used the boat's first aid kit to bandage him as much as possible. They eventually got to shore, and Marcin didn't want to wait for an ambulance, so he picked up his son and started running toward the nearby clinic he knew of. After admitting Max to the clinic, he sat in the waiting room with bated breath and never moved his eyes from the door. Eventually, a doctor came out and told him he had arrived just in time. Any more blood loss, and Max wouldn't have made it. He was extremely thankful for that and made sure to stay at his son's side until he felt well enough to go home, and he remained at his side for the entirety of his recovery period. Max recovered after a few months, but never recovered emotionally from the ordeal, leading to him dropping diving entirely. 
Max and Marcin instead took up biking through the countryside as a hobby. Even though that hobby was nothing compared to their love of the sea, the pair agreed that their safety was much more important and that Marcin could not force Max to do something he did not want. Moving on from the dangers of commercial fishing, we now turn our attention to what happens when divers become too bold and challenge the raw power of nature for the sake of thrill-seeking. Amori Lane was a recreational diver who taught diving classes off the coast of Florida for recreationists of all skill levels who wanted to learn a new skill and more about the world. He was 27 years old at the time of the incident, which took place on April 24, 2000. Amori had gotten together with the class he was supposed to teach for the day. After some routine equipment checks and establishing the learner's skill level, they started up the boat and sailed off the coast some distance until they reached the ideal spot for diving down. As they prepared for the dive, Amori lined all of the students on the edge of the boat, dove into the water, and instructed them to do the same, one by one. They were all in the water by that point, all four of them, and were on their way to the depths to observe a reef and some greenery under the water. The divers were swimming slowly, as it was their first time with scuba gear on, and Amori watched them closely to make sure everything was okay. They were free to roam as long as they were in his vision. But one of the divers took a little too much liberty in their roaming and decided to dive deeper and deeper near the ocean floor of that area. Amori immediately noticed this and signaled the other divers to return to the surface and wait for him. He started kicking toward the lone diver, who was going deeper and deeper into the darkness of the ocean. He finally caught up to him and pulled him by his shoulder quite aggressively, but calmed down quickly and instructed him to get back to the surface. He made a calming gesture with his hands and started swimming to the surface, leaving Amori there and watching him swim up. As he got the confidence to swim back up, knowing the student would not lose his way, Omori saw something out of the corner of his eye, and his chest caved as he realized what he had seen. A large, dark bull shark blended into the darkness around him and emerged with his jaws wide open, straight for Omori. He was too slow to react, and the beast bit into his chest and back, ripping open the wetsuit and puncturing his skin, brushing his ribs. The shock was immense, and he let out a scream, but it was released as a mass of bubbles around him, leaving him without his air. He flailed his arms and struck the shark on the snout, not stopping the beast from biting even harder. It became more difficult to see because of the blood in the water, so Amori's last resort was to use the last of his energy to latch onto the shark's gills and pull with everything he had, which made the shark let go. Despite the immediate relief, the shock and the pain were too much to allow him to swim back up. But his hopes were restored when he felt something pull him by his air tank and toward the surface. It was the diver he reprimanded, and Amori woke up on the boat, still bleeding but alive. The rest of the divers applied gauze to his wounds and stopped the bleeding as much as possible, while another steered the boat to the shore to the best of her ability. The boat ambled into the dock and bumped against the wood aggressively, but they paid it no mind and immediately called for help. A few sailors noticed and called an ambulance at the site within 10 minutes. Amori was admitted to a general hospital in the area, and his wounds were addressed just in time so no lasting damage would be apparent. He remained in hospital for a week and he could go home to recover completely. As it turned out, the diver who was feeling rebellious had noticed what was happening in the deep and rushed to help his instructor. Nestled along the rugged coastline of Australia lies the idyllic town of Byron Bay. Renowned for its stunning beaches and world-famous surf breaks, this paradise lures adventurers and water enthusiasts from across the globe. However, it's also important to note that it's among the locations with the highest number of shark attacks. Our first story will delve into the heart-stopping tale of a fearless young surfer, Sarah Anderson, and her fateful encounter with a predator lurking beneath the waves. 
For this young woman, surfing had always been her refuge, where she could find solace and freedom. But little did she know that her peace would forever be shaken by a pair of very hungry jaws. It was a bright summer morning, August 7, 1981, when Sarah Anderson, an experienced and passionate surfer, paddled out into the turquoise waters of Belongil Beach. She had gotten a day off from work and decided she would not spend it lounging around at home, but rather on the beach, in the sun, along with a friend. She and her friend Amanda arrived at Belongil Beach sometime around noon, leaving their boards and personal belongings on the beach while they had a bite to eat. After about 20 minutes, they added some extra wax to their surfboards and carried them into the water. With ease, she skillfully rode wave after wave, relishing the serenity of the ocean on a scorching hot day. The water felt refreshing as she paddled farther into the distance, eager to catch bigger waves. Little did she know, an instinctual power lay concealed beneath the vibrant azure surface, biding its time ready to make its move. The mighty predator, one of the sea's apex predators, patrolled those waters. A great white shark, its powerful presence concealed by the depths, awaited an opportunity to unleash its raw fury. They were surfing for close to an hour, catching a variety of waves, both large and small, and eventually their session had started nearing its end, and she was simply left sitting on her board next to Amanda thinking about how much fun she had, but something felt wrong. She cut her conversation with Amanda as she told her to wait and to listen. The water around them was rippling aggressively, despite no wind or waves. Just as her mind had started to process what might have been going on, she looked back and saw the unmistakable silhouette of a dorsal fin slicing through the water. Her heart skipped a beat. Instinctively, Sarah's survival mode kicked in. Adrenaline coursed through her veins as she fought against the impending danger, desperately paddling on the board as she urged Amanda to do the same. She had noticed the shark next to them and understood the urgency. The shark closed in, its immense power and stealth sending shivers down her spine. It surged between them, choosing Sarah's surfboard to bite into, making her fall into the water, flailing wildly. Amanda recalled hearing Sarah's screams getting drowned out and cut off by her going under the water's surface. The shark clamped down on the board, and she could see it swinging high above the surface as the shark thrashed its huge body around. After a few moments, it finally let go of the board and submerged again. Fearing it might come back to attack her instead, Amanda paddled forward on instinct, looking back to see Sarah clinging to her board for dear life. She called her, but to no avail. She was vomiting seawater, and her eyes were closed, burning. Between vomiting and screaming, there was nothing she could do. As Amanda tried to circle around and maybe help Sarah, she saw her get pulled under the surface along with her surfboard, which was still strapped to her ankle. Amanda screamed as she realized the shark had returned and she sat on her surfboard in shock. She remained there trembling as she saw the water turn a deep shade of crimson. She finally saw something come to the surface. It was Sarah, but she was lifeless and floating idly in the water, bobbing up and down, revealing her legs were gone. The shark had taken them along with her best friend's life. She stated that she doesn't remember how she managed to get to the shore, let alone call for help but that incident was enough to deter her from entering any body of water for the remainder of her life. People are usually scared of the unknown, and one of the biggest unknowns that humanity has still not explored to the fullest is the ocean. The ocean harbors a variety of primordial life that can kill anyone easily, but few strike fears into the hearts of humans as sharks do. Sharks are one of the oldest predators in the world's oceans. They have remained unchanged, perfect, and as hungry as ever. The ferocity of a provoked shark is a force of nature on its own, something that Emma Ferguson would find in her deadly encounter with an annoyed bull shark at her local aquarium. Story 1 Emma Ferguson, a college student studying engineering in Columbus, Ohio, 
intended to switch schools once her pre-engineering program was up. She had always wanted to be a marine biologist, but some personal issues held her back from that dream, so she took up the next best degree, according to her parents' wisdom, engineering. Although she enjoyed the courses and had no issues passing her finals, she didn't feel fulfilled from the experience. She was not the most popular girl, but she had a close-knit friend group that preferred to spend their time indoors playing Dungeons & Dragons or video games. One of her friends, Marco, worked in a zoo near their city and would often bring his friends in after hours to enjoy the animals without concern for other people being a bother. One day, Marco invited Emma and another friend, May, to visit the zoo late at night because they were installing two new exhibits in the aquarium, a shark tank and a seal enclosure. Emma and May jumped at the opportunity as it seemed exciting, so they met Marco at the zoo the following night. Arriving at the zoo, Emma and May found it creepy since no people were around, but Marco was comforting. Men were working on the enclosures with the animals still in them, so they elected to walk around the zoo until the work was done. They visited various enclosures but were disappointed that their favorite animals were sleeping. However, nocturnal animals were a sight as they roamed freely around their enclosures. After about an hour of walking around the zoo, the trio returned to the newest exhibit and marveled at the size of the shark tank and how cute the seals were. These animals were understandably stressed from transport and seemed to be on edge, but the group didn't register this as they were still in awe. The girls walked up to the seals and admired them and their fat little bodies, while Marco took a special interest in the sharks. As the girls looked at the seals, Marco climbed up the small platform to the top of the shark tank which had a flimsy plastic lid to keep it shut, likely to make feeding easier for the keepers. Marco was a keeper, but he had been on the job for only a few months and usually kept to the reptile enclosures. He snapped open the lid in one section of the tank and stared into it. When May called him out on this stupid decision, he told them to climb up with him and check it out. May refused outright, but Emma was curious and climbed the platform despite her friend's warnings. When she reached the top, she was amazed at the sharks and how gracefully they were gliding through the water below them. They whispered among themselves about how elegant they looked and seemed so close. Emma, seemingly entranced, slowly reached out for the water to feel its temperature. It felt cold, shockingly so. She dug deeper into the tank as the sharks congregated at the bottom. There were three of them in total, three massive bull sharks. She turned her gaze toward Marco with tears in her eyes. She told him she regretted not pursuing her dream of studying marine life as originally intended. She said the moment the two of them shared could have been her day-to-day -day life, but she was stuck doing something she hated. Marco hugged her and said things always turned out well, but they didn't consider that one of the sharks was getting much closer to the top of the tank. The two turned back to look at the tank, and Emma pulled her still hand back. The sudden movement caused the shark to flex in the water and surge towards Emma's arm. It was too fast. Emma screamed as the shark clamped down its strong jaws on the middle of her forearm, pulling her to the floor above the tank. Marco held her up and didn't let the shark's weight pull her into the tank, only making her scream worse. Sharks usually let go of their prey after the first bite, but these sharks were stressed and hungry so it only held on to her out of desperation for a meal. It pulled harder and harder until Emma felt the most shocking and burning pain she had ever felt in her life. Degloved. The skin from her forearm gave way and followed the shark's teeth into the cold water. Emma shrieked as her arm burned, but passed out from all the pain. Marco pulled her back from the tank panting and throwing up at the sight of the mangled tendons and blood still dripping from her skinless arm. He told May to call an ambulance right after Emma got bit, so they were on their way. He gripped the part of her arm that still had skin with all his might to staunch the bleeding while May ripped up her hoodie to apply a tourniquet to her arm. They succeeded and the blood stopped flowing, but Emma was still not responding to them. They could hear paramedics running through the zoo hallways to get to them, since they were in an urban area and the ambulance's response time was remarkably short. 
This speed ended up being the only reason Emma survived the incident as she started to go into shock. They carried her off to the vehicle and left Marco and May on the ground in their urgency. May slapped Marco for letting her do something stupid, but Marco broke down in sobs. They sat there for 30 minutes, unsure of what to do. Ultimately, they went to the hospital to see their friend, but it took a week for her to stabilize enough to talk to anyone. She pulled through the incident, with her doctors claiming she would have to get grafts to mend the damaged skin. However, the psychological scars never healed, and Emma developed an irrational fear of fish and large animals, which crippled her desire to be a marine biologist. Marco lost his job and decided to quit college due to the depression that set in after he blamed himself for Emma's incident. Even though Emma forgave him for what happened, they cut ties and moved on with their lives. The next story in our repertoire concerns a dancer from France named Maria Moulin and her boyfriend Klaus. She was 25 when she visited Bali with her boyfriend Klaus. The two spent the majority of their lives in France, her dancing and conducting classes on the matter, while Klaus was a carpenter. They had been together for four years when they decided to go on the trip, something they were both planning for months. When the time to leave came around, they boarded a rental car and departed for the airport. It was a long and annoying flight, as they had a few layovers which lasted over 18 hours. Exhausted, they reached Ngura Raya Airport in the wee hours of the night and immediately decided to book a cheap motel for the night before departing for Mangus, where their accommodation was set up for the week. Early the following morning, the pair packed their bags into a taxi to Mangus. It took them over an hour to get there, but the entire way to Mangus was strung along the shoreline, making for breathtaking sights and a calming atmosphere. When they finally arrived at Mangus, they spent about 30 minutes looking for the establishment where they had booked their stay. They eventually found it with the help of a very conversational local. Their hotel was excellent, as they looked for something decent yet affordable. The rest of their day was spent seeing the sights and visiting local attractions, as neither wished to pack more things and lug everything to the beach. The following day, they decided to get an early start and leave their hotel to go to the beach, where they would lounge around and forget about all the worries of their lives in Paris. When they got to the beach, they managed to snag a comfortable spot in the shade and unpack some essentials. They were fortunate to find a free space as the beach and the water were filled with vacationers, just like them. Maria enjoyed the few hours she spent on the beach, reading a book, when Klaus asked her about getting into the water, as the people seemed to be dispersing bit by bit. She agreed, and they swam out to the buoys before they treaded water together in a loving embrace. Just as they exchanged pleasant words, Klaus felt something surge around them. It startled both of them, and they panicked as they had no idea what it could have been. The water was deep where they were, but it was still quite difficult to see what was below them. As another surge of water spun them slightly, Maria felt something coarse brush against her leg. It was painful, and she instinctively clung to Klaus with everything she had. He had a tougher time treading water at that point, so his breathing quickened, and he panicked even more. He suggested they should swim back to shore, but Maria was too scared to let go of him. As he struggled to kick back toward the beach, he felt a strong sense of unease, followed by an immense pain in his foot as his mouth filled with salt water. They were both submerged and could barely tell what was happening around them. The water was foamy and his eyes stung, but Klaus managed to open them and he breathed in even more water when he realized what was happening. A massive hammerhead shark twisted around them, trying to get an angle for another bite. While keeping his eyes fixed on the shark, Klaus pushed Maria toward the shore, and he fought to kick and swim in the same direction, despite the raging pain in his foot. It was bleeding, and he glimpsed some tendons sticking out, but he knew getting away was more important. Just as he started gaining some headway on the shark, it lined itself up and swam directly toward him, sinking its teeth into his side. He could feel the beast's sharp teeth 
grinding into his ribs before they snapped, and he released even more air from his lungs through the agonizing pain. He grabbed hold of the arches of the shark's head and attempted to push it away, but it was simply too strong. In utter desperation, he jammed his fingers in the shark's eyes as deep as he could, and that finally made it let go of him. By this point, Maria had surfaced and started screaming at the top of her lungs as she swam toward the shore, much to the horror of the beachgoers. Some of them immediately swam out to help the pair, grabbing Maria first before escorting her back to shore, a shaking mess. Klaus was not as fortunate. Just as he managed to breach the surface and take a new life-giving breath, he felt another strong surge of pain in his right thigh followed by another dunk in the blue chaos. The shark grabbed him again, releasing a mass of blood in the water around them, so he could not see a thing. The only thing he could see was the faint flapping of the legs of his rescuers in the distance. The last thing he remembers was the feeling of being pulled and a searing pain in his thigh as the shark ripped apart his thigh muscles, causing him to lose consciousness. He vaguely remembered opening his eyes on the beach to people arguing and a female voice screaming, but it was all washed away in the darkness. He later woke up in a clinic bed, connected to IVs and bandaged up wherever he looked on his body. Everything was aching, despite the painkillers, and he found that Maria was by his side, waiting for him to wake up. It took him about a week to reach the point where he could stand and another three days before he could withstand the flight back to France. It took months of physical therapy, but Klaus ended up pulling through and making a recovery, albeit his movements were more mechanical than they were before. The locals from Mangus commented on the incident and stated that seeing hammerhead sharks were usually reserved for Lombok, another area in Bali. That shark was never seen again, and fewer people frequented the beach for multiple months following the incident. Seth Cunningham was known as one of Florida's most daring and talented jet ski racers. With his lightning-fast reflexes and unmatched water skill, he won numerous championships and became a local legend. His passion for jet ski racing drove him to constantly push his limits, seeking new challenges and adrenaline rushes. Seth arrived at a pristine beach along the Florida coast one sunny morning. The waves were just right, and the water glistened under the sun's warm rays. He unloaded his jet ski from the trailer, excitement building within him as he prepared for another exhilarating practice session. As Seth revved up his jet ski and sped away, the salty ocean spray kissed his face, and his heart soared with every jump and twist. He effortlessly navigated the waves, performing jaw-dropping maneuvers that left spectators in awe. Little did Seth know that lurking beneath the waves, a formidable predator silently observed his every move. A massive great white shark, its sleek body concealed beneath the surface, had detected the vibrations of Seth's jet ski and became intrigued by the unusual disturbance in its territory. The great white shark lunged out of the water with lightning speed, jaws gaping wide, and clamped down on Seth's leg. The sheer force of the attack sent Seth hurtling into the air, blood staining the surrounding water. Pain seared through his body as he realized the severity of the situation. Panic surged within him, but his training and instinct kicked in. Seth fought back desperately, delivering swift blows to the shark's snout and eyes. The shark was seen to be flinching with his attacks, but it didn't seem to back down too soon. The shark continued to lash onto his leg and bite harder, causing Seth to scream in pain while trying to fight back. The pain in his leg was now traveling up to his whole body, but his determination to live was stronger. He kept fighting with his bare hands to be free from the jaws of this dangerous animal. Though injured and disoriented, he broke free momentarily, buying himself a precious few seconds of respite. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, he scanned the area for help. To his astonishment, a group of fellow jet ski racers had witnessed the horrific attack 
and immediately sprang into action. Without hesitation, they sped towards Seth, determined to rescue their fallen comrade. Fear mingled with fierce determination as they navigated the treacherous waters. As Seth struggled to stay afloat, his strength waning, his fellow racers arrived, surrounding him like a protective shield. They formed a tight formation, creating a barrier between Seth and the menacing shark. Their collective presence seemed to confuse and intimidate the predator, providing a temporary reprieve. One by one, the jet ski racers distracted the shark, maneuvering skillfully to divert its attention away from Seth. They zigzagged through the water with incredible precision, their synchronized movements bewildering the great white shark. Their efforts allowed Seth to be safely hoisted onto the back of one of the jet skis. Seth clung to the racer, exhausted and in excruciating pain, with gratitude etched across his face. The other jet ski racers continued to ward off the shark, their unwavering teamwork and courage showcasing their bond as a close-knit community. The racers, utilizing their superior knowledge of the water and the agility of their jet skis, skillfully guided the shark away from Seth and back into the vast depths of the ocean. A sense of relief washed over the group as the danger subsided, but their heroism would not be forgotten. Seth was rushed to the shore where emergency responders awaited. Though battered and wounded, his spirit remained unbroken. The bravery and selflessness of his fellow jet ski racers had saved his life, and he vowed to honor their heroism by returning to the sport he loved. Seth's story resonated far beyond the Florida coast as news of the incredible rescue spread. It served as a testament to the unwavering bond of a community and the indomitable human spirit. From that day forward, Seth and his fellow jet ski racers have grown closer and assured each other to be there whenever one of them gets in harm's way. Willow had always been fascinated by sharks. She had spent years studying their behavior, trying to understand what made them unique and feared. It was her life's work, and she had spent countless hours diving in the waters off the coast of California, observing their movements and patterns. One day, Willow decided to venture into one of the area's most notorious shark attack hotspots. She had always been careful in her research, taking every precaution to avoid being attacked. But on this day, something went wrong. Swimming near a reef, she suddenly felt a sharp pain in her leg. Looking down, she saw a massive great white shark latched onto her calf, its razor-sharp teeth digging into her flesh. Willow panicked, thrashing around in the water, trying to free herself from the shark's grip. Then she saw Amir, another scientist who had been studying the same area. He had been watching from a distance, and as soon as he saw Willow being attacked, he sprang into action. Meanwhile, the shark's attack on Willow was quick yet brutal enough to nearly kill her. The shark's bite on her calf was too strong and forceful, enough to tear her leg apart from her body. Willow screamed for help as she saw her blood mixing with the water while the shark was biting her. The shark moved its head left and right to shake Willow's body, causing her to feel weak from head to toe. She lost all hope until she realized that Amir was coming to her aid. Amir was an experienced diver who quickly swam towards the shark, armed with a spear gun. He knew that he had to act fast if he was going to save Willow. As he approached the shark, he aimed his spear gun and fired. The spear hit the shark's side, causing it to release its grip on Willow's leg. The shark tried to snatch Willow again, but Amir kicked the shark's face several times, causing it to swim away, disappearing into the murky depths. Amir quickly swam to Willow's side, grabbing and helping her to the surface. She was in agony, her leg bleeding profusely from the shark's attack. Amir knew that they needed to get back to shore quickly if they were going to save her life. With Willow clinging to his back, Amir swam back to shore as quickly as possible. They were met by a team of paramedics who rushed Willow to the hospital, where she underwent emergency surgery to repair the damage to her leg. For the next few weeks, Willow remained in the hospital, recovering from her injuries. Amir visited her daily, bringing her flowers and checking on her progress. He had saved her life, and Willow was forever grateful.
As she recovered, Willow began to think about the attack and what she could learn from it. Sharks had always fascinated her, but now she wanted to understand them even more. She wanted to know what drove them to attack humans and how they could be prevented from doing so in the future. With the mirror's help, Willow began a new phase of her research. She started to study the behavior of sharks even more closely, observing them from a safe distance and learning more about their habits and patterns. She worked tirelessly, determined to find a way to protect both sharks and humans in the future. Eventually, Willow's hard work paid off. She developed a new system for tracking and predicting shark attacks, using her knowledge of their behavior to identify areas where they were most likely to strike. Organizations adopted her system, helping to prevent countless shark attacks in the years that followed. Willow never forgot the attack that nearly took her life. But she also never forgot the bravery and selflessness of Amir, who had risked his life to save hers. Together, they accomplished something remarkable, and Willow was proud to have him as a friend and colleague. In the end, Willow's legacy lived on. She continued to study sharks for many years, and her research helped change how people thought about these incredible creatures. She proved that they were not mindless killing machines, but complex animals with unique behaviors and patterns. And through it all, she never lost her sense of wonder and awe at the beauty of the natural world. As often depicted in movies and media, sharks are portrayed as menacing and fearsome predators that ruthlessly devour anything in their path. However, this portrayal does not fully capture the reality of these captivating creatures. Contrary to popular belief, most sharks are not inherently aggressive toward humans, as humans are typically not part of their natural diet. Despite this, we can't deny that shark attacks are becoming more common as time passes. This video has five of the most bone-chilling shark attack stories that will keep you up at night. Riley was a vibrant and adventurous 17-year-old with an insatiable love for the ocean. Growing up along the coast of a small beach town, she had spent most of her life mastering the art of surfing. The thrill of riding the waves, feeling the salty breeze on her face, and being one with the vast ocean expanse made her feel alive. It was a sunny day that beckoned surfers to the beach. Always eager to catch the perfect wave, Riley waxed her board and headed toward her favorite spot. Her long golden locks cascaded down her back as she walked barefoot through the warm sand, her surfboard tucked under her arm. As she reached the shoreline, the sparkling waves called out to her, their rhythmic dance mesmerizing and inviting. Without hesitation, Riley plunged into the water, feeling the initial shock of its chill before her body adjusted to the temperature. Her heart raced with excitement as she paddled further out, scanning the horizon for the perfect wave. Unbeknownst to Riley, beneath the surface lurked a powerful predator the bull shark. As she paddled closer to where the waves broke, she felt a sudden gust of wind, causing her to lose her balance. In the blink of an eye, she was sent tumbling into the water, her surfboard catapulting away from her. Confusion and panic gripped Riley as she fought to regain her bearings. Disoriented and disarmed, she was now vulnerable to the dangers lurking beneath, and that's when she saw a dark shadow gliding smoothly toward her. The enormity of the shark's presence sent shivers down her spine. Fear coursed through Riley's veins, but she refused to succumb to it. She had to fight to survive. Summoning every ounce of strength, she thrashed her arms and kicked her legs, trying to create as much noise and movement as possible, hoping to scare the bull shark away. But the predator seemed undeterred closing in with an unsettling determination. And within a moment, the shark finally pounced on Riley's leg, causing her to panic and scream instantly. She tried kicking the shark's face with her other leg to deter it away, but it was useless. The shark kept latching onto her leg and began shaking her body through the water, with blood now leaking from the shark's mouth, indicating that the teeth had already sunk into Riley's flesh. 
She let out a piercing scream in excruciating pain as she was still trying to fight the shark with her arms and free leg. She was terrified that this shark could tear her leg apart at any moment and no one would know since she was about to die. Just as hope faded, a heroic figure appeared on the horizon, a lifeguard named Malik. Malik was known for his incredible bravery and skill in the water. With his keen eyes, he had spotted the commotion from the shore and sprung into action, diving into the water without a second thought. Malik's strong strokes propelled him through the water, his adrenaline surging as he raced toward Riley. He immediately punched the shark's face and gills, causing it to open its jaws wide and let go of Riley's badly injured leg. His training and experience kicked in as he fought against the resistance of the water, shielding Riley with his own body. As the shark lunged, its jaws snapping shut, Moloch managed to land a powerful punch to its snout, momentarily stunning the creature. Seizing the opportunity, he kicked with all his might, creating a barrier between them and the shark. He yelled for Riley to swim back towards the shore, despite the wound on her leg, her safety now in her own hands. Together they swam, their hearts pounding with the crashing waves. Malik's focus never wavered as he continuously scanned the water, ensuring the shark would not attempt another attack. With every stroke, Riley could feel the weight of fear replaced by the hope of survival. As they finally reached the shore, gasping for breath, Malik and Riley collapsed onto the sand. The beach erupted into applause and relieved cries as onlookers realized the danger they had just escaped. Riley's eyes brimmed with gratitude and awe as she looked at Malik, her rescuer, who had risked his life to save her. After the encounter, Riley went unconscious. Malik noticed that she had a severe bite wound on her leg, causing him to take her to a nearby hospital for immediate medical attention. One of the most stunning natural wonders in the world is the Great Barrier Reef. Located off the coast of Australia, it's the world's largest coral reef system, spanning over 1,430 miles and consisting of over 2,900 individual reefs and 900 islands. It's home to a remarkably rich range of marine life with thousands of different types of fish, sharks, turtles, and coral. More than 50 different kinds of sharks live on the Great Barrier Reef, from tiny reef sharks to huge predatory sharks like the tiger shark and the great white shark. Sharks are essential to the reef ecosystem, preserving diversity and maintaining equilibrium. The reef shark is one of the most common inhabiting the Great Barrier Reef. These sharks are often just one and a half to two meters long, making them small. Although they normally pose no threat to people, they may become hostile if provoked. This reef has always been popular with tourists. The Orpheus Island crew welcomed Marina and Ule, who had recently married, into a suite on the island for a romantic getaway. There were several brochures for the island's numerous activities on the nightstand by their bed in the honeymoon suite. They took notice of one of them, which offered some snorkeling activities where they could interact with the fishes and turtles that frequent the areas and explore the local flora underwater. Marina woke up with the sun's rays blissfully reaching her face through the rustic curtains. Breakfast had just been brought to their room. She handed the pamphlet to Ule, and they soon agreed to go on the snorkeling adventure. Why not? They should make the most of their vacation their parents paid for. Both of them were quite spontaneous, but not nature lovers or explorers. Their perfect honeymoon would be spent in the suite and the pool. They met the man whose photograph and contact details were on the pamphlet. The man's name is Bruno, and he was designated chaperone for these activities. His family had been doing that for years, and the chief role was transferred to him. It was only right to carry on with the task after the passing of his father. He enjoyed working with tourists who had never gone snorkeling in these waters, but could sense when someone was uninterested. Marina did not like the equipment and was uncomfortable putting the snorkeling mask on since it would ruin her makeup. 
Bruno was very patient and started his already rehearsed explanation of the tour. The couple did not look amused, but rather bored. They decided they did not want to risk much with the activity since they had never gone snorkeling before, and Bruno agreed to it, respecting their wishes. Ule felt the seaweed tickling his feet while sitting on the dock. They were ready to jump in. Even in that shallow part, the water was clear and full of life. Sea snails, clams, crabs, fish, and coral, simply another abundant world was right in front of them. The three of them waded through the waist-high water, swimming briefly and looking into the crystal-clear depths. Marina and Ule were mesmerized, so they decided to go a bit deeper. The water was cold, but they adapted quickly and got comfortable. Marina saw a sea turtle swim right past her, unbothered. Bruno had lent them an underwater camera, so Ule wanted to take a picture of Marina in front of one of the corals they encountered. She managed to get in the frame, and Ule snapped the picture. They decided to go back to the dock, but not before surfacing. Bruno gave them a knowing look as they tread water and told them they would enjoy it. They were getting close to the dock, swimming comfortably, when Marina saw a shadow in her peripheral vision and began to panic. Bruno said it was probably nothing, but as he looked back and took a moment to dive down and check, he resurfaced in a panic and told them to swim to the dock as quickly as possible. As they swam, Bruno said there were two black-tipped sharks behind them, but nothing would happen as long as they were calm. Marina's heart raced as the sharks came closer. They were not particularly quick, but they were getting closer nonetheless. Ule reached the dock first and climbed up, grabbing Bruno's hand and pulling him up. The two of them looked back to see where Marina was, and she was still swimming. As she approached the dock, they saw the water foaming and splashing aggressively. Marina's arms flailed above the surface of the water as she screamed. Bruno dove into the water, and as he reached her, all he could see was blood. Bruno saw Marina screaming under the water through the redness as a shark bit onto her foot and tore it off. She was in agonizing pain. He swam forward and grabbed her by the arm to pull her back, but one of the sharks turned on him. It bit into his thigh and thrashed, but he quickly pulled it by the gills and it let go. He kept swimming while holding on to Marina as tightly as he could, and they reached the dock before the sharks regained their interest. Ule helped Marina get onto the dock, where she continued screaming as the blood rushed out of her leg. They tied a spare shirt around her leg, which managed to stop the bleeding, but she was still deathly pale and needed medical assistance. They carried her to the hotel's infirmary, taking her in and addressing her wounds. The honeymoon was cut short, but she pulled through and learned to live with a prosthesis. Sharks have gained a bad reputation in the media's representation that they're all vicious, man-eating predators who will kill without mercy. Yet this isn't all true about these majestic creatures. Sharks are mostly not dangerous to humans and will choose to avoid human contact, but that doesn't mean they're also completely docile. This is a reason why the fear of sharks is still reasonable, and these four stories will tell you why. Henry Rowland had been a fisherman all his life. He grew up in a small coastal town in Australia, where he spent most of his days on the water. Fishing was more than just a hobby for Henry, it was his livelihood. He had spent countless hours perfecting his craft, and he was widely known in the area as one of the best fishermen around. Despite the recognition from his peers, family, and other people, Henry remained humble and simple and continued doing what he loved for years, fishing. It was never an easy thing to do, but he enjoyed every second of it. One sunny day, Henry decided to head out to the ocean to try his luck at catching some large fish. He packed his gear and set out on his boat, eager to spend a day on the water. He had no idea that this would be a day that would change his life forever. As Henry cast his line into the water, he felt a tug on the line. Thinking he had hooked a large fish, he began to reel in. He was enthusiastic that he began to think that this may be his biggest catch for today. 
Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his leg and knew he was in trouble. A bull shark had latched onto his leg and pulled him into the water. Henry was in shock as he struggled to free himself from the shark's grasp. He tried to fight it off with his fishing rod, but it was useless. The shark began to shake him like a rag doll through the water, with blood coming from the wound caused by the animal's bite on his leg. He lost grip on his fishing rod and started kicking the shark's face and nose with his other free leg, but it was also useless. He began screaming for help when he found his body slowly weakening and his leg tearing apart. However, he repeatedly squirmed and kicked the shark with all the strength left in his body to survive. However, the shark was too strong and Henry quickly lost consciousness. As he faded away, he saw a boat approaching him. The boat belonged to Rowan, another fisherman out on the water that day. As Rowan got closer, he could see the struggle between Henry and the shark. He quickly realized that Henry was in danger and sprang into action. Rowan raced over to Henry's boat and jumped onto it, armed with a harpoon. He quickly assessed the situation and aimed the harpoon at the shark's head. With one swift motion, he thrust the harpoon into the shark's skull, killing it instantly. Rowan then pulled Henry out of the water and onto his own boat. He could see that Henry was badly injured and needed medical attention. Without hesitation, Rowan radioed for help and sped back to shore as fast as he could. Once they arrived on shore, Henry was rushed to the hospital. He had suffered multiple bites and wounds from the shark and was in critical condition. The doctors worked tirelessly to save his life, and after several hours of surgery, Henry was stabilized. Over the next few weeks, Henry slowly recovered from his injuries. He was grateful to be alive and owed his life to Rowan. The two men became good friends and spent many more days together on the water. The attack profoundly affected Henry, and he became an advocate for shark conservation. He began speaking out against shark hunting and campaigned for stricter regulations to protect these creatures. He even started a non-profit organization to raise awareness and funds for shark conservation efforts. The attack also affected Rowan, who has never seen anything like it. He was traumatized by the experience and had nightmares for months afterward. However, he was proud of himself for saving Henry's life and was glad he could make a difference. In the end, the attack brought these two fishermen together and gave them a deeper appreciation of the dangers of the ocean. They continued to fish and explore the water, but with a newfound respect for the creatures beneath the surface. They knew they had been lucky to survive the encounter and were grateful for each other's company and support. Fishing is one of the oldest pastimes in human history and is present in every corner of the globe. Large-scale commercial fishing is one form of fishing that keeps entire economies afloat in the world, but it comes with its risks. From lines ripping off entire limbs to getting digits frozen off in frigid gales, commercial fishing is extremely dangerous. Another risk of the practice also lies under the surface. The first story we have today is about Robert Dean a seasoned fisherman with years of experience who met a tragic end at the jaws of a very hungry and angry great white shark. On August 18, 1982, Robert Dean woke up in the ship's sleeping quarters very early in the morning, 4 a.m. to be more specific. He felt groggy, but work was work, and he got dressed before emerging onto the main deck and talking to the crew to see what they had to do for the day. The weather was awful, the rain spewed everywhere, and a thick sea fog limited visibility considerably, but they decided to keep working to meet their quota. The ship was an offshore vessel, meaning it was used to hunt various fish species, such as cod, tuna, and halibut. For this voyage, the prey was a halibut. Using large nets, the crew would use the pulley system to haul the fish and drop them into large tanks inside the hull. The work was hard, but simple and efficient, which Robert grew accustomed to. The net cast the previous night was ready to be pulled up, and Robert was the one that stood at the edge of the deck, looking down to see if the net was caught on anything. It started out of the water fine for the first third, 
but the net wouldn't budge from that point. Fearing that there was a mechanical error that might rip the net and let the fish escape, Robert called for the pulley to be stopped as he looked down and inspected the situation. Two more crewmates were next to him. The line was still taut, and they could hear the pulley creaking in short bursts, making them think it might have gotten caught on something. The creaking got louder and louder until the frame broke above their heads and came crashing down through the surface of the water, along with the very heavy net. One of Robert's colleagues recalled the incident faintly, but remembered feeling a strong blow on his upper back and a crushing pressure on his chest. The pulley knocked all three off the deck's edge and into the freezing water below. The three of them were dazed by the impact and were sluggish to start swimming when they fell into the water, and Robert was the last one to regain his senses. He woke up to his colleague holding him by the forearm as he shouted for him to get moving. Hypothermia was only one of the problems they could encounter in a situation like that, and they had to swim for the life jackets that the other crewmates tossed into the water. The waves were fairly strong, and they frequently dipped under the surface. At this point, Robert's colleagues saw something haunting under the water's surface and started screaming for all three of them to get to a portion of the ship with a foothold as soon as possible. There was a great white shark under the water, still biting into the net ferociously. It was massive and thrashed at impossible speeds as it tried to tear through the thick ropes. Before long, it spotted the three of them frantically swimming to the ship and abandoned its battle with the net for some easier prey. Morgan, one of the men with Robert at the time, was shocked and was constantly screaming for them to hurry up, but it was to no avail. Before long, all three felt a presence around them followed by the most harrowing scream from Robert as the shark crushed his legs with a single bite. He screamed and was pulled under the water, followed by Morgan holding on to Robert. The visibility of the water was completely obstructed by the blood from Robert's wounds, and Morgan could do nothing to stop the shark from pulling him to the icy depths. He had to let go of his arm. Robert's pained face descended into the darkness as he did, something Morgan would never forget. The other two men tried their best to swim back to the boat, only a dozen yards away. They made it to one of the ship's ladders, quickly climbed up, and immediately turned back to look for any signs of Robert being okay. They stayed there for a while as the commotion among the rest of the crewmates reached its peak and died down when they realized that the situation could not be helped. Emergency services were called and they stopped the ship to assess the situation. The fishing vessel that Robert and the others were working on was sent back to shore after they gave their statements and recalled the incident as well as they were able. A few days later, the crew was notified that they could not find any traces of Robert's body and that the search was brought to a halt, assuming his death. Further voyages were canceled for two weeks out of respect for Robert and to ensure the safety standards were thoroughly looked into, as the mechanical failure responsible for Robert's death could have and should have been avoided at all costs. Morgan and the rest of the men returned to work in solemn silence as they were still processing what had happened to their friend and trusted colleague. Morgan did not return to work. He resigned the same day, as he could never truly accept what had happened and could not face coming back to commercial fishing.